Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 656 of the podcast. And it is Tuesday, the 15th of November, 2022, as I record this. In today's show, Jay Thorne and I discuss using generative AI tools for music and visual art and images and our latest thoughts on Web3 and NFTs. So I've been doing shows on NFTs for almost two years now. And if you need an introduction, please have a listen to my solo episode 610 back in March 2022, when I outlined all the different ways authors will be able to use NFTs for creativity, collaboration, community and cash. Plus, I have interviews on legalities and copyright and the financial side and lots of things that you can find all the links at thecreativepen.com forward slash future. That's where uh, I link all of these special episodes. So there has indeed been a lot of mayhem in the crypto world, even in the last week. But Jay and I remain convinced of the utility of original digital assets and collectibles on blockchain. And uh, you need to separate the financial side really from the utility side. But it's early days and it's a little like 1997 before the internet dot com crash or 2007 in the early days of mobile. And we can see a glimpse of the future, but we don't know how it's going to shape out yet. So we are experimenting. So in terms of generative AI, I've also done lots of episodes on that, again, linked at thecreativepen.com forward slash future. But a few things that we mention, Jay notes that Mid Journey version four has been released and it is a real step change and it even changes prompting. So it's interesting. We talk about prompting in the episode, but it's, things are moving on so fast. Uh, it's just worth playing with these things depending on when you're listening. So with version three, you had to prompt using a lot of different words to try and be more exact about what you wanted. And, and if you are a real artist, real in inverted commas, if you're someone who knows what they want with visual art, then the long prompts are still relevant. But if you're mostly like a normal person like me, uh, then your prompts can now be quite different. So I'll, I'll link, I'll put some of my images in the, um, in the show notes so you can see, but I did, I just did one, which was a flamenco dancer spinning towards her death. And that prompt, oh, it's just some beautiful pictures. <laughs> so you can use a very basic prompt and mid journey version four will come up with something pretty amazing. I'll link to the article about it from Ars Technica. But if you're using mid journey already, just add dash dash V space four on the end of the prompt. Okay, so DeviantArt, one of the biggest communities of artists online who originally made a massive fuss about this whole thing, they are now launching their own AI generation engine and also providing a way for artists to opt out of their images being used to train models. So on the one hand, they're going to have a DeviantArt specific engine and also this opt out clause. Now, personally, I think opting out of this is probably a way to disappear as an artist. If you're going to say, I'm not going to use generative AI and I don't want my work to be used in training tools, I think other artists who embrace the models will potentially be the the prompts of the future. And yeah, personally, uh, as I discussed with Derek Murphy a few episodes ago, I think it would be better to aim to be used as a prompt. So you become more of a name brand artist. And there's this whole thing, if, you, if you're into tutorials or you, you, know, you, you use Google to find tips and things, if, if you look for mid-journey tips, a lot of it will be how to use different artists as references. So as Kevin Kelly said in The Inevitable, which is a fantastic book. It's so prescient. I always go back to it. Uh, it says, this is not a race against the machines. If we race against them, we lose. This is a race with the machines. You'll be paid in the future based on how well you work with robots. It is inevitable. And of course, here, the word robot can also mean AI tools. So since version four of Midjourney was such a 
step change. And really it is. I, I mean, I, I could show you pictures from version three and version four using the same prompt and they're so different. The, the quality is just incredible. Um, so I'm very interested in the rumors of GPT-4, which of course many of us using text generation are using GPT-3 and many of the text tools right now are based on GPT-3. So if GPT-4 is coming in the next few months, which uh, I have um, there is a rumor uh, based on a tweet from Robert Scoble, uh, Scobalizer at Scobalizer. I'll link to it in the show notes, who is usually privy to such things. So if GPT-4 is such a step change from GPT-3, that is going to be a very big deal indeed for text generation. So if you have not played with generative AI tools yet, please put it on your list for uh, over the holiday season or in 2023, because this is not going away. This is this is accelerating. Uh, it's accelerating much faster than I thought it would. And as ever, my goal is to help you navigate the approaching wave of possibility in a rapidly changing technological space for creatives. Specifically, that's my angle. Uh, if you want more detail on AI and prompting and all of this, what does it mean, ethics and the problems? Because there are problems problems and I do tackle that. Uh, check out my course, The AI Assisted Author. And I also cover an overview of how NFTs might fit into the future economy of being an author in my course on the creator economy, both available at thecreativepen.com forward slash learn. So I hope you find today's episode useful and Jay's interview is coming up very soon. But first of all, today's show is brought to you by the friendly folks at Written Word Media, which I use all the time, actually, is pretty much my primary um, email promotion site. So Written Word Media knows that marketing your book can be one of the most challenging parts of being an author. That's why they make marketing easy by providing quick, easy and effective ways to promote your books. Written Word is best known for their email promotion sites, Free Booksy, Bargain Booksy and Red Feather Romance. They have five promo sites in total that send daily newsletters to a combined audience of over one million readers. They even have a site to promote your audiobooks called Audio Thicket. When you purchase a promotion with Written Word Media, your book is sent to thousands of readers who love and read your books in your specific genre. As the email hits inboxes, you'll see a flurry of sales or downloads of your title. Email promotions are based on how many readers are in the genre and range from $25 to $500. To help you get the most out of your book promotions, Written Word Media recently launched Premium Membership, which gives authors 10% off their book promotions and special access to products and services like the new partnership with Yonder, a premium serial fiction app offering curated stories in every genre. Visit writtenwordmedia.com forward slash membership to take advantage of this discount or send them an email at info at writtenwordmedia.com to ask for recommendations on which promotion will best meet your goals. And as I said, I use Free Booksy and Bargain Booksy pretty much every every 90 days or so uh, for my first in series. And um, if you are an author who has a lot of books, um, certainly uh, or if you want to do more regular promotions, then check out the premium membership. And I am I think this is super interesting. And Written Word Media wanted to be a sponsor of our futurist episodes because they're committed to the future of um, success for authors. So I'm really thankful for that. And of course, this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. Uh, I really appreciate it. And of course, if you're a patron of the show, you get the monthly Q&A, which I will be recording. Uh, in fact, it, it might go out before this does. <laughs> And you'll also get a percentage off my ebooks and audiobooks and courses. Uh, you can support the show with just a few dollars or euros or pounds, whatever your currency is. Less than a coffee a month for the extra monthly Q and A audio and supporting the show. You can support the show at patreon.com, p a t r e o n dot com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Jay Thorne is a best-selling horror and dark fantasy writer, and he also writes non-fiction for authors. He's a podcaster at Writers Inc. and the Music NFT Show, and Jay and I have co-written co several books together, including Risen Gods, co-writing a book, and American Demon Hunter's Sacrifice. And we also share an interest in NFTs, blockchain, and Web3, which we're talking about today. So welcome back to the show, Jay. Hey, Joe. 
<laughs> it's, it's weird for me to hear you introduce me prior to us talking. It, it feels odd. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, you, uh, for anyone who hasn't been listening to the show a long time, you've been on lots of times and we've done lots of things together. But I feel like this is like the latest thing we're doing together, having worked together on and off on lots of things. I, I will have recapped in the intro like what NFTs are, so we don't need to go into that. But we talked in February 2022. So it's nine months later as we record this in November 2022. And it's really important to timestamp it because lots of things have changed and moved on. So start by telling us about what's changed for you in terms of your own NFT projects and what are you doing in this music scene and everything? What are you up to? Well, yes. The last time we talked feels like a lifetime ago in this space. I've I've fully embraced the future and we're going to talk about several of those aspects in this conversation. As far as uh, specifically what I've been up to, I started a podcast called The Music NFT Show I'm doing it with my youngest daughter who's seen and we're focusing on music and that's been great because she's very into music, writing her own, and that's been a wonderful thing to do together. I started creating some generative music pieces on a platform called Async, which I, I'm sure we'll talk about. And uh, and I've just been immersed in in the culture. I've been purchasing NFTs. I've been following the industry more so on the music side than publishing, but also just always straddling that line and seeing what can I take from the music industry and bring it into publishing and vice versa. Well, let's get into that a bit more. You mentioned generative music pieces on async. So uh, for people listening, we are going to mention sort of language that might need a bit of explaining. But one of your things was Nosferatu. Oh, sorry, Nosferatu. Is that right? (laughs) Which (laughs) I bought one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, with, with funny spelling. But tell us, what are your NFTs at the moment? So I've minted two projects and the third one will be live by the time this episode airs. Uh, they are generative music projects. And what that means in plain speak is that, um, and generative art is not new. Generative art has been around since the 60s, but we now have the technology in Web3 for basically everyday people to create generative art. So essentially, the artist or the creator will make certain aspects of the art, but then the final piece is determined by an algorithm. And in a lot of generative art, that means that the algorithm is developing a unique piece of art. So for example, Nosferatu is a generative music piece that was inspired by the movie Nosferatu, which is having its 100th anniversary this year, which is one of the reasons why I chose it. But essentially what I did is I created a song and I wrote a song. And instead of recording, say, one guitar part or one vocal part, I recorded and produced multiple And so I think of these as layers, as you might in Photoshop. And so essentially, I load all of these layers or what's called stems in the music industry up to the platform. And when someone purchases one of these digital collectibles, one of these Nosferatu digital collectibles, the algorithm will pick one guitar track, one vocal track, one drum track, and assemble them and then present that as the collectible to the owner. So essentially... I've created one song, but every time someone purchases one of those songs, they get a unique mix of it. And tell us more about Mission as well, because that one is going to be the new one that's coming out as this goes out. Yes, Mission is is the one I think authors might be most interested in because I'm calling it an audio drama. It's essentially a short story that I wrote with uh, J.D. Barker, gave me a lot of help on the short story. We went back and forth with it about 12 or 13 times times. It's about three or 4,000 word short story. And then I had David Lawrence, the 17th, who's an incredible narrator. I had him do the the narration on it. And then I took the narration and I built a sound bed underneath it. So with my guitar and some other tools, I created a soundscape and I put that all together and that's going to be called Mission. So it's sort of this blend of music and narrative storytelling in a digital collectible form. I think it is quite hard to explain why we're so interested in this, but we're like when I minted my uh, one of ones, and we're talking about digital collectibles, really, we'll come back to other things. But when I minted my one of ones, which was a piece of AI generated art with an ebook as extra content, I actually felt this kind of loss when I sold it. Like it was much more an emotional experience 
than I expected, which I don't feel when I just get some money for an ebook that is <laughs> up there or like on Amazon or even on my own store because they're not one of ones. They're not the collectibles. And I felt just as passionate about this digital only product than I as I do with when I'm proud of a book. So tell us, like, why are you so excited? Why are you so interested in creating this way? What's the emotional appeal, the creative appeal? Oh, this is, uh, I mean, I could go on for hours about this. Uh, <laughs> I, I've always had a love of the intersection between art and technology. And I look back over my life and I, I see that recurring over and over again. I've always been very optimistic. I've always tried to embrace new tools and try and do things that couldn't have been done prior to the advent of those tools. And I think that when we talk about Web3 or blockchain in the most general sense, that's what has me the most excited about it. And I know that for you, that one of one piece was very personal because you were taking photographs that you took and you were manipulating them in a way that, that made them really unique and, and outstanding. And I think that's what I'm looking at too. I'm looking at how can I use a new technology to generate art in a way that I couldn't do it before. And at, at the highest level, that's what excites me the most. It's mostly generative art and it's going to be both music and narrative storytelling, but it's this concept of creating a, a new kind of art that just wasn't possible before. It's interesting because uh, I distinctly remember you being pretty anti-AI when we first had a discussion about some of the possibilities, but now you're using these generative tools as part of your creative process. So how has your opinion on AI shifted? <laughs> uh, you were so kind to send me this question ahead of time, but I knew it was coming anyway, so I was going to be prepared <laughs> for it. I want to say this, uh, this might sound defensive and I don't mean it that way, but I don't ever apologize for changing my mind. I'm constantly learning and growing and discovering. And I find that people who don't change their mind are difficult for me to, to engage with. <laughs> so yes, I, my stance on AI has shifted and I'm going to talk about how I use the AI tools. I will also say though, and this is something I think I said, although I didn't go back and listen to it on, on the Writer's Inc., but my, my stance on AI is that I personally, I'm not going to use it to replace the aspect of creation that I enjoy the most. And I think this came up in the context of novel writing. And I said that the first drafting and coming up with the words is the most enjoyable part of that process for me. So I'm not philosophically opposed to people using AI in that context, but I wouldn't do it because that's what I enjoy. Now, that being said, yes, my mind has changed on AI. I think I was more resistant to it at first, but I'll give you a, a couple of examples where I'm really leaning on AI. And I'm, again, I'm creating art that I couldn't do before. I am down the rabbit hole on Midjourney. <laughs> I'm in, you know, I've, uh, I've super paid for fun, the, right? Super oh fun. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I've paid for the monthly account. Um, I'm using it to create the album art for my music. And that's just not something I could do before. It, it's incredibly inspiring. I mean, your talk with Derek was wonderful. It really sort of jump-started my interest in it. I've used Dolly too, but Midjourney is the one that I'm really enjoying. And more recently, literally just this week, there was a, a music plugin called Emergent Drums that was released, and it's AI drum sampling. So what it does is, if you're a non-musician, don't worry, I'll explain this in basic terms. It uses an AI to generate drum samples. So if you want say, a certain, like a kick drum or a snare, you click a button and it generates it. And what that means is other instead of using, say, pre-recorded samples or using someone else's drum recordings, the AI creates things that are unique to you. And every time you click generate, it creates a new sample. And then as a musician, I can take those samples and I can alter them and change them much the same way you did with your photograph. And so I, I really see AI becoming more integral. And yes, it is going to eliminate some tasks. And yes, that is going to mean that certain people will be out of work. But that's always been the case from the printing press on. Every time there's a new technology, it shifts the skill set and some jobs go away and others are created. Yeah. And I think the same thing. I mean, like you mentioned with the drum there, I think it's exactly the same with text. It's exactly the same with images. And I see this as a sort of world where there's even more digital abundance than there is now. So there's already more images than we can ever see. But what this does is, I mean, since I had that talk with Derek a few episodes ago, every episode 
show notes has an image generated by AI for. So in the past, I would buy custom art for the shareable image for social media. But now I just generate a custom piece for each show. And it's my piece. It's like the drum thing you mentioned. But the key point, if people still haven't tried these tools, is you have to give the AI tool the creative direction. Yes. Like it, it does not come up with this stuff itself. And even if it does at some point, you know, there are these things called GANs where you can kind of go backwards and forwards. But with this stuff, we're giving it a creative direction. And then we are, as you you mentioned altering it changing it curating it you could just press spin and if you didn't like that drum thing it would just generate something new so to me that's the human part is our creative direction and the altering changing and curation because it just doesn't do it on its own right no it doesn't it's going to force us to redefine what an artist is and it's going to force us to, to redefine some of the creative processes. And I think that's okay. When I have conversations about people who are not following this space as closely, the question I always ask is, I say, do you consider photography an art form? And almost everyone I ask that question to says, well, yeah, absolutely. I said, well, if you study the history, there was a lot of resistance to photography. It was going to put painters out of business. And it's not a real art form because all you're doing is clicking a button. But we know now that photography is an art form because... You as the photographer, you have to frame the shot. You have to understand lighting. You have to understand filters. You have to understand all of these inputs. It's not just as simple as clicking a button. And I think that's the analogy I'm trying to use now with these new AI tools. Mm. And in fact, let's talk about Photoshop. I mean, Adobe has announced their own AI generative image base and all of these tools that we already use are going to import these types of generative AI tools. They're just going to become part of normal creative process. And I guess I feel like that is something that we've done as authors and obviously you as a musician as well. We've adopted these technologies into our processes and just continued along our way, creating the things we want to create and using the tools we want to. It's interesting. You mentioned Mid Journey more than Dali, and I completely agree. I find Dali actually is a bit stock photo y, whereas yes. Mid Journey feels artistic. Is that what you think? Well, yes. And I know this is a very timely, and we're in the weeds here on, on Mid Journey, but they just rolled out version four of their AI, and it's unbelievable. It's stunning. I mean, I. I have another generative art project probably coming out in December called NOLA, and it's going to be historical. It's going to be music, and it's historical, but it's going to be based on late 19th century New Orleans. And so I was creating images of women at Mardi Gras in the 1850s in the French Quarter. There's no other way for me to make that. <laughs> and yet, through prompts, I've created these images that are just draw. I mean, they're jaw-dropping. They really are. That's very cool. And yes, prompting. I mean, when you sit on some of these, you know, you can sit in these newbie channels and watch people prompting. And I've seen prompts that are like 300 words. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 And like, this is a good point that you're bringing up because like for the AI drum samples, does that make me a drummer in the traditional sense? No, not at all. But I'm still a creator. And, and, and like I, I see AI prompt developers as a new artistic expression. It could be a new industry for all we know, but you're right. It's not as simple as just clicking a button. Like you really have to direct the AI and there's nuance involved. And even changing one word can radically change the results that you get. Yes. And in fact, playing with those words, it's so interesting. It is like learning how to talk a new language, depending on how the way you put things, the order you put words. And sometimes the image that comes out will be nothing what you expected in your kind of human mind, but it might be even cooler. And that's what I think I love about this. And if people are interested, you can follow like on Instagram or on Twitter or on any of these platforms like a hash mid journey or hash generative AI. And there's some incredible, beautiful art coming from generative artists. So yeah, I really, I think we've talked there about creativity. So we should probably get more into the business. I guess just to be clear, when we talk about Web3, you and I, we're not talking about blockchain and NFTs. That's not Web3. To me, Web3 is all of these things coming together. So these AI tools, they're not blockchain. Like Midjourney is not blockchain. It's a generative tool, Dali. These are new AI tools. But to me, the kind of Web3 phase of 
the world <laughs> includes AI as well as things that might be built on blockchain, NFTs, that kind of thing. What do you mean by Web3? I, I'm in 100% agreement with you. I wish there was a better term because all the terms are confusing. Blockchain, Web3, NFT, uh, most people don't know what any of those mean. and They're a bit hard to understand. I'm just looking at this new technological wave. I haven't felt a wave like this since the late 90s. And that was really when the internet started to, Web 1.0, when that started to, to emerge. So that's what I'm thinking about. I, I agree with you. I'm not necessarily talking about Ethereum. I'm not talking about AI or I'm not talking about NFTs. I'm talking about this general wave of technology that is going to transform our lives in a way that hasn't happened in decades. Yeah, totally. I would say that for author's perspective, it's a bit like 2007 when ebooks really started to go mainstream with the Kindle and digital audio. So I think ebooks, digital audio, for us, you and I, podcasting really started to take off then. So right. I mean, I feel like that early sort of 2008 to 2012, that was that, and that's more than a decade ago now as you and I talk, which seems crazy. We're so old. <laughs> 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 but I feel like that was a really, in, and that was a web two situation there. So that's what we mean. Just to be clear, people listening, we're talking about, as you say, a, a wave of new technologies and surfing this wave into the future, as I always talk about, <laughs> uh, not drowning in it, which is the hard bit. So we've talked there about creativity and both of us are incredibly passionate about creativity, but we're also business people. We like to make a living. Uh, we want to make some money. And we've been to a couple of conferences, one together, the Creator Economy Expo in April. Then you were at the Crypto Business Conference and I was at NFT London and you were at NFT NYC. <laughs> so tell us a bit about what you found interesting in terms of the business side, the potential business side of Web3. Yes, definitely. I, I have a high level takeaway and I'm really curious to hear what yours are since you just came back from NFT London very recently. For me, I think what I've learned this year and what I think is most relevant to authors and creatives who might be listening is that regardless of how you feel about this, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> it's not a fad. The genie is out of the bottle. And so you have to decide how you're going to engage with this new technology. I just don't see it going away. And that's a really important distinction to make. You can love it or hate it or feel emotional about it or feel like it's a Ponzi scheme, but the, the underlying technology is here and it's just not going away. Yeah. I mean, were there specific takeaways from crypto business about what people can do be doing now or soon? Or was it a case of this is what's coming or this is what's here? Yeah, especially for the crypto business conference as opposed to NFT NYC, which was more of a more mayhem than <laughs> uh, <laughs> Michael Stelzer did a great job with the crypto business conference in that it was a single track, small event, and uh, with a lot of opportunity for engagement. And what I heard over and over from every speaker was just the importance of community in the future. And even not even necessarily re related to Web3, but just in general, that the future of business is going to be built around community. That that we're, we're joining smaller groups of like-minded folks. And that is really, that's the future. And I think that the reason that kept coming up at the crypto business conference is because the technology that's emerging really facilitates that. That's interesting. I would say that that's also partly because of the need for curation in a world of absolute digital abundance where every single person can create everything new every day, <laughs> multiple <laughs> times. Like we said, every time you want a new image, you just go on mid journey and make it. Just the exponential number of images created at the moment is, is, is kind of crazy. But to me, part of being part of communities and leading communities is that curation aspect because it is, it's just too big. Like it does feel like it, everything is exploding in a good way but yet it's hard enough for you and I to keep up with this sector and we're really interested in it so right. I feel that part of that community aspect is paying attention or finding people you want to pay attention to but in a way I don't feel that's any different like I feel that's been true for a long time true true yeah it has I mean I would love to hear what did you distill out of NFT London more recently 
Yeah. So as we speak, I was only there like just a week ago and it was a multi-track event. And I think what was what I really got out of it was the en- so much energy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. There were so many people who were building. And as we speak now, it's a bit of a down market for a lot of this stuff, even just the wider tech industry. There's a lot of layoffs. So there's a lot going on. And the people who are building at this downtime are the ones who are really passionate about it. And I tell you, the other thing that was really encouraging is there were people, there were young people there. So there were people who were 19 to 25, like you mentioned your daughter. I heard a couple of young musicians speak who were just you know, we are building the future of music. (laughs) And they were like, screw the labels. This is the way we're going. And they were articulate, they were creative, they were passionate, and they were mostly people from more marginalised communities, certainly here in the UK. So I thought that was really interesting. But also, there were people our age and older. So I saw one panel chaired by a woman who was specializing in blockchain for the environment and was looking at the agricultural sector. So that's what was interesting. We talk about this in art and music, and it is literally, I don't know, a tiny piece (laughs) of what this means. I mean, they're using blockchain to track agricultural products into the land. And there are so many applications. And so it was multi-track and it was a huge program. And the talks were only like 25 minutes each. There was something like 900 speakers at NFT London. I spent a whole day going from room to room and it just got a sense of it. And I, as I said, and this, sorry, this woman who was doing the environmental stuff, she must have been in her 60s. And she's been in this space since the beginning, because she sees it as the way to fix the environment, which was lovely talk to go to, because of course, a lot of people say, oh, you know, blockchain or whatever is going to destroy the world. But people are fixing the stuff in order to use the good stuff well. And so I just came away feeling like, wow, this is great. The other thing I felt was like you mentioned the chaos. I really felt like, oh my goodness, this is still early. (laughs) (laughs) So many questions and every talk people would bring up some of the problems that are, that need to be solved. But I was listening to one of the A16Z podcasts with Mark Andreessen from Andreessen Horowitz, who invests in a lot of this stuff. And he was saying what he sees as an investor is if there are still problems to be solved, that's where the business opportunity is. So I thought that was really interesting. And we only have a sustainable platforms, lots of platforms, if people are interested in building businesses, because it's all very well in um, free for all, let's all do it for the fun of creativity. But people have to make some money in order for things to carry on for the long term. So yeah, I, I felt like it was new, but I also felt the sort of energy of excitement, like we are building the next iteration of the internet, basically. Yeah, I, I, that's that's wonderful to hear. And I felt that at every conference I've been to this year. And I think it underscores how important this is because it's a really tough market right now. <laughs> Whether you're talking crypto or NFTs, like this is a bear market. It's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And yet there's a core group of passionate people who can see through to the other side and they're kind of pushing it forward. And to me, that's really inspiring. There are so many reasons why some of this technology and some of these projects are going to go ahead. I do feel like we can't really tell what will emerge as winners. I mean, I feel like there's a utopian view, which is we're going to be the new Amazon in Web3 or whatever. And it's like, well, partly that's not the point. (laughs) (laughs) The kind of decentralization is that I don't need that. And So to give an example, let's come to books. So I built my Shopify store earlier this year. The reason I went with Shopify is because they have crypto payments and NFTs in beta. And at some point, presumably soon, let's say the next year, I'll be able to sell NFT products, whether that's my art or my books or your music or whatever, in my NFT store, in my normal store, alongside my eBooks, my audiobooks, my print on demand, they'll just have a hook into that, whatever that is. And so I'll be able to sell that direct on my own. And there were quite a lot of talks from platforms who were trying to build like a KDP or a draft to digital on blockchain that I, I don't know, I was challenging them and saying, well, why do I need that? You know, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Why do we need some of these platforms if we've built communities? Yeah, 
You're right. And I've had the same head scratching thoughts about, and I'm not going to name them. I was trumpeting some of them just six months ago, but there's a tendency to, to gravitate towards Web 2 technologies and transplanting them into Web 3. And I think you're right. I think it's, we're in a moment where now we're saying, well, wait a minute, is that what we really want? Like, do we want another centralized platform or do we want to have creators have the ability to sell things directly? I, I think it's the latter of the two, but it's an evolution. It's a process. And, and I think mimicking the Web2 platforms was probably where we started. Yeah, yeah, completely. And at the moment, the only thing we have in our heads. So when I say NFT ebooks in people's heads, it's just an ebook. So they say, why would I do that? But what you discussed earlier with your mission is uh, music. I mean, it could just be, well, just buy the ebook short story, right? But right. you've created more a, a different experience that combines different levels of art and creates a one of one generative piece that becomes more interesting to own than just like downloading your ebook and reading it. I mean, is, are we separating the concept of a like an ebook or an audiobook and making NFTs new products? Well, I've taken your idea and used it in that even when I speak in generalities, I don't talk about NFTs. I talk about digital collectibles. Mm. Uh, NFT is a terrible term. No one understands what it means. But a digital collectible makes sense. And I think it gets to this, uh, you know, talking about the use case for NFT books. I don't think we necessarily disagree. I think there's some nuance in how you and I are viewing this. I think that what I'm seeing right now is I think NFTs are going to be more like merchandise and that they are going to be something new new, a special edition, something unique, something you can't purchase. Will NFT ebooks become mainstream the same way they are on Amazon? I don't know. I mean, I, I might change my mind on that, but I just don't see NFT ebooks becoming the mainstream technology. I see them more so as becoming collectibles, special editions, that kind of thing. Yeah, I tell you what has made me really think about this is Amazon Prime. Again, we're recording this in November, beginning of November 2022. Amazon Prime just introduced pretty much an unlimited music catalog as part of Prime. You saw this, right? Well, yes, but there's a catch. <laughs> they did do that, but it's only on Shuffle Play unless you pay them $9 a month. <laughs> oh, how interesting. So can you create playlists? I don't know because I haven't used it, but I, I've heard some pushback on it and said, like, yeah, if you want to listen to 100 million random songs, you can do that for free. Ah, OK. That's interesting. <laughs> I heard an interview about it. And well, let's just remember that every time we think we know what the hell's happening, they just change the rules anyway. Right. So um, and again, like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, mentioning we were talking about Twitter before we started recording. I mean, again, there's no point in talking about Twitter and it, because it's in so much flux. But it's very <laughs> hard to nail down what the hell might be happening in a month's time. And it's the same right now, like with Amazon Prime. And my feeling when I heard that they essentially i mean that many songs however they did it that's a lot of musicians whose music is now in a different form of royalty so in my mind i do see that these big platforms whichever platforms because there's a lot of subscription platforms it's not just ku for ebooks it could be that the future of digital reading and listening it goes to there's like a big chunk which will be unlimited subscription whether that's through a prime model, whether that's through a monthly unlimited payment for ebooks or audio. So there's that one chunk that I believe will stay like that. And more and more people will just go into digital abundance model. Like I pay Spotify 10 bucks a month and I get unlimited music and podcast and all of that kind of thing. Then I think there's a strata, which is like people buy ebooks and audiobooks from my Shopify store every day. Thank you, everyone, for buying uh, from creativepenbooks.com. And they do that because they're supporting me as a creator. So they want to buy their ebook or audiobook from me directly, but that is a direct relationship. So they know that they're getting the ebook or the audiobook from me, but it's no different to the one they get on Amazon. Then there's a layer of special editions, which NFTs could fit into, which is, again, maybe I sell on my store or I sell on these other platforms. And that is for the even smaller group of people who want this digital collectible or ticket or royalty fractionalization or 
that kind of thing. So I almost see it as, like you said, this is not replacing what we have. This is almost another strata on top. Totally agree. I have been thinking a lot, as I know many people have, about Kevin Kelly's legendary post of a thousand true fans. And I I really see it now as a hundred true fans with Web3. Mm. I think that's the potential. And it's not because NFT ebooks are beginning to go mainstream. That's not where the hundred true fans are going to matter. It's going to be the people who want to support you as an artist, who want to have something special, who are willing to pay for something special. That's where the hundred true fans come in. So I agree. I don't think NFT ebooks are going to replace what you get on your Kindle, but they are going to open up an entirely new paradigm of collectibles in, in a way that can be authenticated and tracked and ized for many years to come. And I do think that some of the royalty fractionalization models like Royal.io, which we've talked about before, where it's essentially a crowdfunding mechanism where people can buy into a song or potentially a book project, a bit like a Kickstarter, but when you actually get royalties later on. So with the Brandon Sanderson example, his 41 million those 41, well, not 41 million people, but the people who joined his Kickstarter, me included, we will get a book, but we don't see any of the future money. Whereas what this will enable is the potential to buy into an author and get a percentage. Now, didn't you do something around this or you had an idea around this? I had an idea around it and then I backed off because there were legal implications. (laughs) I don't want to be flagged as a security. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, I think like the royalty sharing is is on on the philosophical level, I think it's really interesting and it's something to watch. On a practical level, the amount of volume of generated revenue for that to make a difference to the average person is is pretty astronomical. So I don't think it's a bad idea. I think we will eventually get there, but you would need to be J.K. Rowling or a Stephen King and as a reader to be able to benefit from a royalty share, that's, I think you'd need some severe volume, but I think it's the secondary royalties where every author, independent authors, mid-list trad pub authors, it, the secondary royalties is where I think it's going to fundamentally shift the way we generate revenue and how we do that over the long term. The other thing I think will happen is, <laughs> I hate to use the term, but flexing in the metaverse. <laughs> 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 which is just an awful term, but you know, all the cool kids using it. And I think the metaverse has just accelerated. I know meta is an absolute nightmare, but by signing a deal with Microsoft. So my husband works in a company now and he is on Microsoft Teams. He works from home. A lot of people listening, they'll be using Microsoft Teams as part of their job. And Microsoft and Meta just did a deal with the headsets. So uh, Jonathan can absolutely see, like he does all these meetings with digital whiteboards. And at the moment, they're all on his flat screen and he can absolutely see putting on a headset. I mean, he sits at his desk anyway with a screen in front of him and he has multiple screens because he does coding and everything. And he sees the idea of putting on a headset and working in this metaverse space. So that's what I want people to think when we talk about metaverse. It's not doesn't have to be Facebook, but that's a Microsoft metaverse example like you and I are in a zoom metaverse at the moment you could just say it's like a branded world (laughs) in some form but let's say we go to an online conference let's say the crypto business conference online in some kind of metaverse space then how I see nfts also working is this connection with your avatar a lot of the the fashion houses are doing it so instead of saying here's my Chanel handbag or my Gucci handbag or whatever, which is an NFT, I say, this is my special edition Stephen King NFT. And I think it shows a lot about me as a person that my avatar is holding, let's say just holding, I don't even know what it would be. It's like, here's all my books. (laughs) And it's like, we would do a digital handshake and my bookshelf would appear behind me. And you're like, oh, okay, cool. She's into that and into that. And like, I've always said, I'm going to have tattoos in the metaverse. My avatar is going to be like (laughs) fully goth tattooed. (laughs) You're going to be like, where's Joe? (laughs) But I feel like I think that is a really going to happen. Like I would collect things so that my avatar can demonstrate part of who I am. I don't know. I mean, a lot of gamers understand this, right? Gamers buy 
a, this type of weapon or this type of skin for their avatar. So gamers understand it, but a lot of writers might not understand that. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, it, it's coming. It absolutely is. And it's not it, it's not as crazy as it sounds. If, if you're not a gamer or you're very skeptical of the metaverse, as I am, like I recognize how big it's going to be. I recognize the business applications. I'm probably not going to want to go to a concert in the metaverse. I think I'd prefer to go to a real life concert with real people. But I, I think it, it's not outlandish at all. I mean, if you think uh, you mentioned bookcases. Uh, back in the day, I think CD shelves were another example, right? You you go to a friend's house and you want to go look at their bookshelf. You want to see what they're reading. You want to see what books they own. For me and my friends, we wanted to go through each other's CD collection and pull things off the shelf and talk about it. Uh, and so transferring that to the metaverse seems to be a, just a, a very natural thing for me. I, I think that's absolutely coming. Yeah. I mean, even on Zoom, people put a background and sometimes like they'll choose, I don't know, the holodeck or the deck on Star Trek or, yeah. um, you know, people are choosing digital things to show aspects of their personality online. And so I think that's why I think this is another application. It's almost showing something about yourself. But yeah, that might be a bit further away. But let, <laughs> I wondered if we could even attempt to think about how this is going to play out over the next couple of years. I mean, I usually <laughs> I usually am too early, so I will absolutely admit that. I am too early. Like this podcast for example, when I started in 2009, I've still got a blog post up where I was like I was howling into the wind for a, at least 9 months before anyone even showed up. <laughs> <laughs> like before I got maybe five downloads. I mean, seriously, that was 2009. And it was really sort of 2012, 2015, even when things really started taking off. I was four years too early with translation. I wrote my first article about books in the metaverse in 2015. For, and that still not happened. And I said it will only be like two years away or something. <laughs> so I am ridiculously early with these things. But have been talking about this for a good number of years now. I first started talking about AI in 2016, I think it was. So I don't know. What do you think? How do you think the next few years are going to play out? Because, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know either. And I think my, my perspective is, is certainly biased by my age, as all of ours are. I think my approach right now would be very different if I was 21 instead of 51. So, yeah, I think it's extremely early. I am not in a position where I'm looking to make a 40-year career in Web3. So my approach is very different. I think I am less risk averse. I think I'm doing things more out of the enjoyment of the creative process as opposed to the monetary gains. And so that is definitely coloring my perspective. But I, overall, I agree with you. I think we've said there aren't too many people in our lives we can have these conversations with because just most people aren't even thinking about it yet. And I've never, in my, my experience, I've never been hurt by by being an early adopter. I've always benefited from it. And, and I'm taking that same approach here. Yes, I agree. And I thought I did have a handle on how fast this was going. But then I, when the, just a couple of months ago, when AI art blew up, it like went mainstream, basically, just emerged into like the mainstream. Almost overnight. <laughs> yeah. It was really weird. I don't even know what it was that how it took off. It might even have been Mid Journey or the release of Dali 2 or there was something that happened. And now you'll see articles about this everywhere. This is in mainstream press, basically. And I didn't think it would happen that fast. It was only April, was it April? I was minting my generative art pieces using what was Dolly 1, I think. And the quality is so much lower than it would be now with Mid Journey. But I kind of love those pieces because they they show you the time shift, even within six months. I mean, it's crazy how fast this is going. I was literally just before we got on the phone, looking at a new AI called Adept. And it's it essentially, <laughs> it's, it's just crazy. It essentially, you can teach it to do anything on a, on a web browser. So you can teach it to use digital tools and it will do stuff for you. But it's wow. exactly, yeah, I know. And But it's exactly the same as what we were saying with the um, art stuff. You still have to tell it what to do. Like it doesn't come up with something. You still have to teach it what to do. But I'm like, whoa, okay, I, let me think about how I could use that. So I guess my advice for people is still be open-minded and have this attitude of curiosity and then go into things with a playful 
attitude of, oh, this is fun. Like, how could I use this for fun? Not how could I use this for money? And then if you see how it might work in your business, then for sure. But to go in with an attitude of curiosity and play is probably more important at this stage. Absolutely. And that's been my entire approach with music. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to pivot in, uh, into a career as a music producer or a performing musician. I think this generative music has been so fulfilling and inspiring, and it's reignited my interest in music and in music theory and in music production. And I don't, I've totally let go of the result, and I'm focusing on the process and the amount of joy that it brings me. That's really why I'm doing it. And I think that that's what you're saying is taking that approach right now and just being playful and inquisitive and curious, it will pay off in ways that you probably can't even anticipate. Yeah. And it's fun, right? This is why we're doing it. Absolutely. So much fun. (laughs) It's so much fun. So uh, yeah, I mean, the joy, like we're both laughing. You can hear the smiles in our voices and we get all giddy about this stuff because it's really fun. I feel like we haven't in the author space, the fun leached out a little bit at some point. Yeah, we've gotten a little too serious, I think, in, especially yeah. in the independent circles, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But maybe that's because it is our business and this is not at the moment. This is fun. This is hobby. But but, but I mean, I, you know, as you say, we're both paying for Mid Journey, the sort of monthly thing so that we can create more. So we are taking it as a sort of a business step in a way. But yeah, I feel like it's going to be a couple of years before people are using the tools that we're talking about regularly but equally i think they won't even know that they're buying an nft or they won't even know they're using a blockchain tool because that all that language will just fade away that's right i mean we don't need to know an ip address or understand https protocol to use the internet and i think blockchain will be the same way Yeah, absolutely. Well, interesting time. So where can people go to find your nfts and then everything else you do Yes, my my main site is theauthorlife.com. And if you're interested in any of my music production, that's at gears.com. And of course, it's Web3, so it's spelled G3ARZ. <laughs> is that how you pronounce it? Gears.com, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Jay. That was great. Thank you, Joe. So I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Jay Thorne. And as ever, we'll keep updating you on our journey as we continue exploring. And yeah, go and check out Jay's new mission, NFTs at Gears, (laughs) spelled in this very special way. So definitely check the show notes for all the links and some of the images. I'd love to know what you think about this topic because it's definitely emerging very quickly in terms of the generative AI, at least. Leave a comment on the show notes or the YouTube channel. Tweet me at the creative pen with a or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. So next Monday, I'll be talking to Dory Clark about The Long Game, a fantastic book I read over last New Year, and I'll probably listen to it again on audiobook this New Year. I love having these books that give us this longer term perspective and how to have a long term mindset in this very short term world where chasing spikes in sales and and daily cash is is important, but also having this long term mindset as a creative. So uh, that's coming on Monday. Happy writing. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.